A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 34, and skipping, through 53 and 56. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure to even eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him, that's Jesus, and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever Jesus went, into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. For the word of God in its promise and covenant, thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you lead us to find the quiet center, then nothing else matters. And if you do not lead us to find the quiet center, then nothing else matters. Be our rest and our resolve. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, our good shepherd, the one who has written your blessed name upon our hearts. Amen. For the past four weeks, we have been hot on the trail of the Messiah. First, we heard of the promise in the gospel. Next, we considered Jesus' invitation to take the path of the disciple. Last week, we gnawed on Mark's sandwich that tasted of the cost of discipleship. And today, well, well, I don't know about y'all, but I need need a nap. (laughs) Following Jesus can leave you out of breath and in need of a break because Jesus never seems to slow down or so we've been told and choose to believe. Over the past four weeks, we've uh, omitted nothing. We've read the fine print of every verse and wrestled with the passages until we received a blessing. No one promised us shallow waters in discipleship. And Jesus is never, ever milk toast. There's no way to water him down. We cannot dilute him. He's an all or nothing Messiah. So let's be honest and get one thing straight right here at the beginning. Following Jesus is hard work that requires we risk something big like our very lives for something good the future God wants and ultimately will have. Nobody said it would be easy. But in the end, when God gets everything God wants, we'll say that following Jesus was 
ultimately worth it. All of us notice that we managed to skip a few verses in today's reading. This was not my choice. The architects of the revised common electionary did us this most unfortunate favor. We passed right over the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water, scaring the stuff right out of the disciples. Because my preaching professor instilled within me a love for the narrator whom we call Mark. I cannot stand it when the prescribed reading skips over Jesus doing cool stuff. In full disclosure, though, next week we'll embark on a six-week series in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, again, omitting nothing and covering every verse. My working title for this series is Jesus Loves Carbs, because it's all about bread. (laughs) The first story in John 6 is Jesus feeding the 5,000. So had we not abbreviated Today's reading, I preach the same story, the different author, two weeks in a row. I'd be repeating myself, and y'all might catch on. <laughs> but on, on second thought, shouldn't every Sunday be a repeat, a re-proclamation, a re-enactment of the very best most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ. In our abbreviated reading from Mark, Jesus invites the disciples to come away to a deserted place. As soon as they went away in a boat, a crowd shows up, chasing along the shoreline to see where they would dock the boat. And just as circumstances get spicy, we jump, narratively speaking, Now the disciples have crossed over to the land of Gennesaret, and everybody from everywhere is vying to see Jesus. And if they can't see him or get an audience with him, perhaps they can just reach out their hands and touch the fringe of his cloak as he passes by so that they will be healed. Once you've heard there's a promise in the gospel, you'll do everything you can. To live into that promise. To see that it is true. So I, I hate to break it to you that we're left with nothing but a text about the desert. Now, I know we live in northeast Ohio and a desert landscape is not our geography. But... We all know that not much grows in the desert. There's not much to feast upon in the desert, or so we've been told and choose to believe. The disciples have just returned to Jesus from their first ever solo missionary journey excursion. We remember Jesus sent them out two by two with no bag, no food, no money in their belts, just the clothes on their back, sandals on their feet, and a staff in their hands. And my, oh my, look what they done did by God. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. I can hear the disciples, can't you? Interrupting one another with their stories as they clamor for Jesus' attention. Everything happened so fast that the disciples would work right through lunch, forgetting to eat. The disciples were exhilarated and exhausted. And a crash was coming. I think... I think Jesus could sense it. He could see it on their faces. Y'all come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest. Rest a while. Turn off your cell phones. And no, don't put them in airplane mode because there's no Wi-Fi either where we're going. You've worked hard. 
Now rest, recuperate, recover. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life you lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where you are free. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear your eyes that you can see. All the things that really matter. Be at peace and simply be. Had I been one of Jesus' disciples then and there, I would have said, Jesus, wait just a hot minute. I am glad to take a break, and vacation sounds really good, but I need time to prepare. I just can't up and leave. Now, I don't know how long Jesus would have entertained my protest, but I doubt that he'd buy it for too long because I think Jesus can see right through me and yet still have compassion for me. I must confess, however, that I have lamented to Diana on more than one occasion that vacation isn't really worth it because it takes so much time to prepare. And then returning feels like jet lag, even if I didn't change time zones while I was away. Diana reminds me, though, that to not take vacation just means that I'm willing to work for free. To make things more complicated, if you enjoy what you do and if you find it fulfilling, you'll find ways to keep working. Or at least I do. All of us know the old anecdote, say it with me. If you love what you do, you never go to work a day in your life. Now, I don't know who coined that phrase, but I bet good money the person had poor boundaries. I love what I do, and I go to work most every day of the week. A clergy colleague texted me recently and said, well, it's the relentless return of the Sabbath. That's sarcasm, just so we're clear. (laughs) But seriously, Sundays come like telephone poles on the interstate highway at 70 miles an hour, and there's not a thing any one of us can do to slow it down. I often fool myself in thinking that if I work more, (laughs) I can get ahead. (laughs) When a vacation looms, the telephone poles just get closer together. But the time to get everything done doesn't increase. So, hi, church. My name is Nathan. And I am a workaholic. I mean that seriously. It is not a joke. Hear me say that I am not complaining about being your pastor, nor am I questioning my calling, and no, I'm nowhere close to burning out. My confession isn't about ministry. It's about work, any work. To tell you the truth, I've always worked this way. Even when I was teaching school and the admissions associate for Bright Divinity School. And here's the thing, I don't think I'm the only workaholic either because in 2018, the US Travel Association reported that 768 million vacation days went unused that year. Our capitalist culture is unique in that we do not prioritize vacation. In fact, some consider it a point of pride to say how very little they use. 
These false ideas prey on our fears and make us think that we can't take time off because that would be letting someone else down. I believe in hard work. And truly, I love to work. And I think I have the best job with the best church. But I'm trying to let go of the myth that society gifted me, that I am of value because of the work I do. Before moving to Ohio to join this congregation in mutual ministry, a mentor asked me, what do you fear? It's a deep question. I did not have the foresight to say then, what ministry during a global pandemic? (laughs) Actually, my answer from years ago remains the same. I fear standing on a jet bridge, preparing to board a plane for vacation. My cell phone rings with the news that there's an emergency or a death in the church. Do I take the call or step onto the plane? And if I step onto the plane, will I be able to let go and disconnect? This scenario is exactly what happens for Jesus and the disciples. The crowds recognize not just Jesus, but them, all of them. No longer is Jesus the one who's doing cool stuff. The disciples are too. Folks from all over the place hurried, to, uh, hurried on foot to greet the boat and help pull it ashore. Jesus saw the great crowd, Mark tells us. He had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus began to teach them many things. They listened. For they were hungry, at least in a metaphorical sense, for good news about the reign of God, that God had not forgotten them, that God was on their side, that God wanted nothing more for them than to have their daily bread. Speaking of bread, it's hard for people to learn when they are hungry. The disciples, none too pleased that their retreat has been interrupted, tell Jesus in a cranky, tired voice that crumbs across like a shouted whisper, this is a deserted place, and in case you haven't noticed, Jesus, nothing grows in the desert. There's nothing here. It's O dark 30. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. That's the voice one uses when one is tired. Some call it compassion fatigue. I know that voice. I've used it a time or two, maybe more. In November of last year, after a long day of pastoring in a global pandemic, plus an elder and board meeting via Zoom, I wrote an email to a couple of committee co-chairs after 10 p.m. Let me just say that that was not the finest email I have ever written. It was snarky. Strike that. I was snarky and not at all pastoral. I had compassion fatigue, just like the disciples. Within 60 minutes, I regretted sending that email and I crafted an apology note by 6 a.m. the next day. In hindsight, I think I should have just gone home following that board meeting, gone to bed, had some wine. Well, maybe not in that order, but you get the picture. (laughs) Of course, we know what happens in the Bible story. Jesus does what any good shepherd would do. He feeds the crowd and the disciples too. 
All they have to do is take a load off, sit down, let their fingers run through the lush green grass, stretch their legs, and cross their ankles. We may lose our ability to see one another with compassion, but I don't know that Jesus ever does. Jesus has a knack for people who are hung up dry and put away wet. There's enough grace with this Jesus that he looks at us with compassion, even when we're worn out and done with humanity. Perhaps the very best, most beautiful gospel good news is that Jesus acts in our place and on our behalf when we're exhausted and running on fumes. God in Jesus Christ is still present, active, and will not leave us or forsake us. The grace of Jesus Christ will be sufficient for us because the power of God is not perfected in how much we work, how much we accomplish, or how much success we achieve, but when we are honest about our weakness, when we admit that we need to rest, when we're stretched beyond our limits and need a serious vacay. But not included in today's reading, Jesus immediately made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. He was bound and determined for the disciples to have a treat, come heck or high water. Just wait for that one. And, and maybe, maybe Jesus needed some time, too, to be by himself. After saying farewell to the crowd... He went up the mountain to pray. Perhaps Jesus sang his prayer, taking a deep breath between each phrase. Silence is our friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being, touches face, making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope, for faith be gone. I take comfort that Jesus needed time to be alone and cultivated a discipline of silence and rest. Still, Jesus wasn't the first to rest. If we think back to the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, God created for six days. Creation was God's greatest joy. Indeed, creation brought God much fulfillment. God took delight in the work. The creation legend says that God rested on the seventh day. Now, isn't that funny? How peculiar that God, whom we think of as infinite, takes time to rest, to recharge, to enjoy a work week well spent. Furthermore, if God prioritizes rest, shouldn't we do the same? Might our intentional commitment to rest and rest well be a way in which we reflect the image of God? Over the past few weeks, I've had some conversations with church members about congregational leadership. We have a board composed of officers, committee chairs, and co-chairs, diaconate team captains, and elders, too. We have numerous folks who hold more than one position. It's both an elder and a committee chair or co-chair. In fact, last year, we had one person serving in three different capacities. 
We double and triple up. And I worry we're exhausting ourselves. If what I'm saying sounds like nonsense to you, well, congratulations, you're going to be on next year's nominating committee. (laughs) You'll find out. So I'm curious if it is time for us to go away to a deserted place and take time to rest in one another's company without the pressure of having to be on. Jesus will meet us there. Like a good shepherd, he'll look up on us with compassion and he'll feed us and teach us in ways that are transforming. While the disciples are in the boat and on the way to Gennesaret, the winds pick up and they have to row contrary to the squall. It never fails, does it? Adverse winds always come up, especially when we're trying to get away. One oar stroke forward, two strokes back. Some vacation, some retreat. The disciples see a glimmer upon the water. It scares them within an inch of their lives. But Jesus calls back to them, take heart, I am, don't fear. And Jesus, again, does what any good shepherd would do. He gets into their boat and stays with them the rest of the way. Mark tells us that the disciples' hearts were hardened. But let's give those disciples some grace here. This feeling is not their fault. It's the result of exhaustion, fear, and anxiety. And that combination will harden anybody's heart. Finally, the disciples and Jesus get to where they are going. When you know it, more people. Same story, umpteenth verse. I've lost count and so have the disciples. The crowds have heard that there's a promise in the gospel and they've come to see if it is true. But there's another promise in the gospel as well, maybe one that we have never, ever heard. All of the activity here is done by Jesus, not by the disciples, even though they just had some practice. The promise in the gospel is Jesus saying, I've got you and I've got you them. Matter of fact, I've got the whole wide world. Take time. The world's going to keep spinning. And guess what? You are not the center of the universe. Now, admittedly, that sounds a bit harsh, but it's compassion, truly, from Jesus to be liberated from the idea that we're in control as much as we think we are that the world revolves around us. Go to a deserted place and rest a while. I'll meet you there. I promise, Jesus says. The same invitation extends to us today. Will you with me? Will I with you? Will we together with Jesus go to a deserted place and rest a while? I know we're far, pretty far from anything that looks remotely close to a desert, but we do have a lakeshore nearby, and I think that'll work. We also have a beautiful brand new labyrinth downstairs. If you haven't seen it, please take a look at it before you leave. You can walk it at your own leisure Take your own pace. As the path twists and turns, you'll find, you'll come to the quiet center, whatever that looks like for you. Whether in a deserted place, on the lakeshore, or on a labyrinth walk, Jesus will meet us. He'll look at us with disarming compassion so that everything else fades away. That's a promise in the gospel. And it's what good shepherds do. Finally, after we're good and rested, 
will emerge from the quiet center, refreshed and ready, ready to sing. Jesus, lead us on the journey to your future that will be. May our energy and passion spark a flame for all to see. Help us rest when we are weary. Guide us to a centerpiece. Raise us up to meet the challenge for creation to be free.